Rap interviews can become fiery showdowns where the truth is everything, and reporters often mess up. Do nothing. You can't do nothing. That's what I'm saying. You can't do nothing, big man. They ask awkward questions that spark conflicts with rappers who feel they're not getting understood, leading to some infamous face-offs in the hip-hop world. For instance, at the 2017 Black Entertainment Television Awards, Joe Budden and his co-host's interview with Migos was beyond tense. They succeeded, man. Hey man, you guys are nominated tonight. Would you keep your cool or stand your ground? Let's explore the most insane and stupid interviews you completely missed. Stop playing with my name. I'll drill y'all. Stop playing with my name. When rappers face awkward questions. Joe Budden, DJ Academics, and Nendra Alexis were interviewing the Migos on the red carpet. From the start, it was clear that Joe Budden was not in a good mood. When DJ Academics asked Takeoff why he wasn't on the hit Bad and Bougie, Budden seemed almost annoyed, disinterested from the beginning. His body language, arms crossed, frowning, showed he was not just uninterested, but almost angry. He appeared ready to end the interview from the moment it started, wasting what could have been a great chance to talk to one of the hottest groups in rap on live TV. The tension was clear because Budden and his co-hosts seemed on completely different pages. Not backing down, Takeoff challenged the awkward question with, do I look like I got left off bad and bougie? I feel like there's like a running joke with, with you being left off bad and bougie. His repeated questioning wasn't just defending himself but firmly stating his presence in the group, regardless of media spins or public views. As the interview hurried towards an end, Quavo didn't just sit quietly, sensing disrespect. He stood his ground and firmly said, close it, close it, marking their refusal to be put down. The tension hit a peak when DJ Academics tried to wrap up the interview nicely, saying how much he admired the Migos. Close it. Close it. Hey, listen, man, I wish I could talk to the Migos longer, man. It's one of my favorite groups. I've been covering for so long, I'm glad they succeeded. But Budden couldn't handle the fake niceness. Overcome by frustration, he dropped his microphone and walked off, leaving everyone shocked and confused. This wasn't just an exit. It was a loud statement of dissatisfaction with the whole setup. His walk-off didn't just end the interview. It highlighted the deep tensions and showed the gap between black entertainment television's real talk and just putting on a show. In the aftermath, as academics and the Migos dealt with what just happened, the incident remained a clear reminder of the intense dynamics in these high-stakes interviews. In rap, every word and action is heavy with meaning, and conflicts aren't just about lyrics. They're about real feelings, happening live for everyone to see. The Migos reacted differently compared to Lil Yachty's calm approach when faced with disrespect. On the red carpet at the prestigious Black Entertainment Television Awards, the whole quality control team, which includes the Migos, boldly confronted Joe Budden. This direct approach made it clear. They wouldn't tolerate any disrespect. The drama didn't just fade away after the event. On his show, Budden, known for stirring up controversy, claimed he could take two and a half of Migos by himself. This is in your house? I don't know. I think I can take two and a half of Migos by myself. His remarks didn't just keep the issue alive, but added fuel to the fire, highlighting his tendency to provoke further tension. Budden kept provoking as he called the Migos kids. Apparently, everybody views Migos as very tough guys. I don't. I must not be that familiar with their music. Mm -hmm. I still look at them like the kids. Mm -hmm. How old are they? And downplayed their importance in rap. His patronizing attitude caused more anger, particularly with his rude comments about DJ Academics, whom he described negatively. Budden's remarks showed he didn't respect the Migos or the wider hip-hop scene, treating their work as unimportant. Meanwhile, another famous media confrontation involved Birdman during an interview on The Breakfast Club. As soon as Birdman walked in, it was clear he wasn't there to make friends. He demanded respect right away, creating a tense atmosphere from the start. Yes, sir. I want to start this shit off straight, telling all three of y'all stop playing with my name. Let's go on in, let's go. Stop playing with my name. Let's, go let's do in. it on camera. His insistence on respect, repeatedly telling the hosts to stop playing with my name, quickly turned the interview into a heated exchange, making it one of the most unforgettable moments in the show's history. Birdman's forceful demeanor and relentless demands during the interview turned it into a showdown about respect and power. His approach, direct and uncompromising, 
showed he wasn't going to be dismissed or treated lightly. When my name come up, respect it. Let's go. Stop playing with my name. This episode with Birdman, much like the Migos confronting Budden, reflects the intense and emotional nature of hip hop, where respect is crucial and disputes are often public and heated. These confrontations aren't just personal, they're about claiming one's respect and position in the competitive world of hip hop. Birdman's time on The Breakfast Club wasn't just about talking. It was more about him demanding to control what was discussed. I wanted to see you. I wanted to talk to you and your man and your face. Absolutely. You understand me? I knew a few places you was at. I could have pulled up, but I don't think that was gangster. I wanted to come look you in your face like a man and tell you how I feel. He didn't just throw out cool lines for fun. He was seriously making his point clear. This wasn't just a chat. It was Birdman marking his territory firmly telling the hosts how to treat him and his name with the utmost respect. His way of demanding respect was almost comical in how straightforward and insistent he was, ensuring every word was filled with confidence and a no-nonsense attitude. Switching over to Fredro Starr's interview on the same show, the intensity skyrockets. What starts as a walk down memory lane, reminiscing about the 90s hip-hop scene and the beginnings of Onyx, quickly turns tense. Why we got an issue, bro? Because you brought some shit up that I ain't like, nigga, and, it's, and, it's, and, it's, and I don't like that, nigga. I ain't, I ain't no bitch ass nigga. I ain't say you. Charlemagne the God, known for stirring the pot, brings up Fredro's past rumored relationship with Brandy, and the mood shifts dramatically. After the storm of harsh words, watch what happens when another tough moment tests limits of respect and patience. When personal questions cross the line, the air thickened instantly. Bringing up Brandy and hinting at her age during their rumored relationship was a deliberate poke. Fredro's response was immediate. His demeanor changed, and his words became short, showing he was not just surprised, but annoyed by this unexpected and sensitive topic. Charlemagne clearly hit a nerve, mentioning something Fredro considered private and off-limits. Fredro's reaction went beyond mere discomfort. It was a mix of irritation and defensiveness. He showed that certain subjects, especially past personal relationships and controversial rumors, were out of bounds. This wasn't just about an old relationship, but about respecting personal history. Charlemagne pushing this issue only heightened the tension, turning the interview into a clash of boundaries. Despite the high stakes and the palpable tension, the interview did not turn physical, which was unexpected for many viewers. Fredro's intense responses paired with Charlemagne's challenging questions made it seem like a fight could break out at any moment. But it stayed just shy of a physical altercation, a reflection of the intense but controlled environment of the interview. In contrast, another interview incident where a host was actually removed shows the unpredictable nature of such encounters. The outcomes of stepping over the line can vary greatly, influenced by the specific situation and the people involved. While Fred Rowe maintained control despite the provocation, Others might not show the same level of restraint, highlighting how live interviews can edge into risky territory. From the start, Wiz Khalifa seemed relaxed as he sat down with the Danish reporter. They exchanged pleasantries and started off on good terms. However, the mood changed quickly when the conversation took a personal turn. The reporter asked Wiz about his father's death and its impact on his music. This type of question isn't unusual in interviews but it seemed to catch Wiz off guard. Yeah, but you know. Cut this dude off, man. It's over. He managed to keep his cool, admitting that his father's passing had a big influence on him, but he didn't dive deep into details. His responses were careful, though you could hear a bit of discomfort in his voice. I really like the album. Thank you. I listened to it yesterday and I just kept on listening. It was great, cool. Thanks, bro. It's called Only in First Class. First of all, uh, I really liked the, the album. Thank you. I, I listened to it uh, yesterday and I just kept on listening. It was great. Cool, thanks, bro. Then the reporter awkwardly brought up the use of the N-word in Wiz's songs, even joking insensitively about racial issues in Denmark, which only added to the tension. It's called Only in First Class. Yeah. Did you have any concerns using the N-word? Nah, not really. The situation worsened when the reporter messed up the lyrics to one of Wiz's songs. This mistake showed a lack of preparation, 
and seemed like they didn't really respect Wiz's work. In one of your hits you sing, the bigger the bill, the harder the balls. What does spending money have to do with, you know, your balls? The balls. I was I was actually saying the bigger the bill, the harder you ball. Artists usually feel a strong connection to their songs because they express personal feelings through them. So when the reporter misunderstood Wiz's lyrics about spending money and made an inappropriate comment, the interview became even more strained. Then, the reporter made a big mistake by confusing Wiz Khalifa with 50 Cent. This not only showed he wasn't familiar with Wiz's music, but also that he didn't appreciate Wiz's unique style and accomplishments. Mistaking one artist for another and misquoting a song were major errors that made the interview less believable and more awkward. You're originally from Pittsburgh, yeah? How was it growing up in Canada? Another wrong fact, this time about where Wiz grew up, made things worse. You're originally from Pittsburgh? Yeah. How was it growing up in Canada? And out, and he openly criticized the interviewer's ability. He even asked for the interviewer to be replaced, showing how serious he was about keeping the interview respectful and accurate. Wiz's strong reaction showed how important it is for him to be understood and respected during such conversations. The interview seemed to turn into a bit of a joke because of these blunders, highlighting the need for black entertainment television preparation and more respect from the reporter. Interviews with rappers should be energetic discussions about their lives and music. However, they sometimes turn into uncomfortable and contentious encounters. For instance, the intense interaction between black entertainment television Beanie Siegel and Charlemagne Thagod on the popular radio show The Breakfast Club is a prime example. During this particularly tense episode in October 2016, Charlemagne accused Siegel of letting jealousy fuel his diss tracks against fellow rapper Meek Mill, harshly calling Siegel a hater. You sounding like a hater lately, man. A hater? Yeah. How you, how you say that? This strong accusation did more than create drama. It questioned Siegel's motives and damaged his credibility as an artist. When did you ever hear me say that? On Tax Podcast. Absolutely you said that. You was like, yo, he can't rap better than me, which could be a fact. And, you know, um, um, that used to be me. People come up to me all the time and say when you was in that position. Siegel, known for not holding back, strongly defended himself. He challenged Charlemagne's grasp of the situation and pointed out that Charlemagne might not fully understand the feud or its origins, making such a personal attack inappropriate. The confrontation revealed the deep tensions black entertainment television had, turning what could have been a simple interview into a contentious standoff. As Siegel faced questions about his legal disputes with Meek Mill, he argued that Charlemagne lacked the necessary details to judge him fairly, suggesting that the host's accusations were baseless. You ain't qualified to ask me that question, you ain't qualified to get that answer, bro. The argument escalated quickly, with Siegel growing visibly frustrated. He felt that Charlemagne's questions were not only misinformed, but disrespectful indicating that Charlemagne was possibly more interested in stirring controversy than in uncovering the truth. This wasn't just about an artist defending his music. It was a significant clash over the right to judge someone's character. By threatening to walk out of the interview if the topic wasn't changed, Ziegel made a strong statement about maintaining control over how he is portrayed and discussed in the media. With tension still in the air, the next encounter might show more than ego clashes, possibly revealing secrets some wish had stayed hidden. Struggling for respect in public discussions. This confrontation wasn't merely about defending artistic choices. It was a robust response to perceived inaccuracies and assumptions in the media portrayal of his disputes. When Siegel called Charlemagne a sucker, he wasn't just showing his anger. He was rejecting the entire premise of the conversation as dishonest and manipulative. This moment highlighted the power dynamics that often underlie celebrity interviews, where artists must navigate not only the questions they are asked, but also the interviewer's motives. Similarly, Kodak Black's visit to Hot 97 for an interview with Ebro, Laura Stiles, and Peter Rosenberg started off on a rocky footing. Ebro openly expressed his reluctance to interview Kodak due to his previous controversial appearances setting a confrontational tone right from the start. This prelude created an unwelcoming atmosphere, casting a shadow over the potential for a productive dialogue. From the outset, 
It was clear this wouldn't just be a promotional chat, but a probing and possibly uncomfortable interaction. Kodak's situation exemplifies the complexities artists face during media appearances. These scenarios are not merely opportunities to promote work, but can become platforms where their public personas and personal decisions are scrutinized. As in Siegel's case, Kodak faced a challenge that was less about the music and more about navigating a conversation laden with skepticism and judgment. How long was the build for you? Because I remember like two or three years ago, it, it felt like when your name popped up, it felt like when you hit the mainstream, it happened very quick and you became a star sort of overnight. Um, and then there was the controversy and all these different things. Both situations underscore the tension black entertainment television media personalities and artists where interviews can quickly shift from promotional activities to defensive dialogues, highlighting the intricate and sometimes adversarial nature of such public interactions. For a whole 17 minutes, Ebro and his team had a chat with Kodak Black that started off simple enough, glossing over his music career. But things quickly took a nosedive into awkward territory when Ebro decided to bring up something far more personal, Kodak's ongoing sexual assault case. It was a hard left turn from casual to serious, and you could practically see Kodak cringe as this touchy subject was laid bare on the table. Look, man, at this point, it's a pleasure to meet you, man. Um, you know, looking at all your, your cases and everything you've been through, and I know the recent one right now is very sensitive. And with respect to, you know, everybody involved in that case, you know, we can't get into details today. Um, but, you know, we take sexual assault here serious, and we can't, you know... Uh, get into details, but we hope, you know, to have you back so we can have a, a deeper conversation about that because, you know, this is a serious topic and we're hearing these stories a lot. It was obvious he wasn't thrilled to discuss such a private and delicate matter in such a public setting. We take sexual assault very seriously here and we can't get into the gritty details, but we'd love to have you back to talk more about this. It's a heavy topic and it keeps popping up. Ebro pushed, oblivious to the discomfort he was causing. Kodak was tangled in a nasty case back in 2016, accused of raping a young girl in a hotel room in South Carolina. The stakes were high. If found guilty, he'd face major legal consequences. So it stood to reason he'd rather not air out the dirty laundry for fear of tipping the scales against him in court. But just when you thought it couldn't get more uncomfortable, Ebro threw a curveball, switching from a tense legal discussion to moon landing conspiracies. Yes, really. It was a weird, out of the blue pivot that felt both inappropriate and insensitive given the previous topic's gravity. Here's something offbeat we're discussing today, and I've got a feeling you might be into this. The 1969 moon landing. Fact or fiction? What do you think, Kodak? Ebro asked, trying to shift the mood but only succeeding in adding more tension. One thing we were talking about on the show today that for some reason I just have a hunch that you would care about is the idea that landing on the moon was a conspiracy. Kodak, do you believe that our moon landing in 1969 actually took place? What the fuck y'all talking about? <laughs> Kodak, already on edge, was not amused. It seems like you enjoy watching me squirm. Change the topic or I'm out, he threatened, clearly at his limit. I feel like... <clears throat> Sometimes when niggas like be going through shit, like y'all be entertained by bullshit. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. So like, change the subject. I'm finna walk out. Despite the warning, Ebro plowed ahead, ignoring Kodak's discomfort. We shifted gears to the moon landing nonsense. Let's pick something else. Actually, I think we're done here. No need to drag this out, Kodak responded, signaling the end of the conversation. All right then. Remember, you don't run the show here. Ebro shot back as Kodak left, showcasing a perfect storm of how not to handle an interview. Switching scenes to a 2010 interview, Gucci Mane appeared on Angela Yee's Sirius XM radio show, and the atmosphere couldn't have been more different. Angela and Gucci's interaction was filled with flirty undertones, a stark contrast to Kodak's rigid and uncomfortable sit-down. One standout moment was when Angela asked Gucci about what he looks for in a woman, leading to playful banter that was clearly outside the bounds of a standard interview. Now, if you uh, got married, would you get a prenup? It depends on who I married. Really? You would consider not doing that? Yeah, I would consider that. What kind of woman would you want to marry? Marry. What kind of woman would I want to marry? 
Angela's flirtatious demeanor and probing questions created a light, almost intimate atmosphere, marking the interview as anything but typical. Think about it. It's like someone you know well, right? Nobody can take me for a ride. I just did, and you didn't even notice. Can you handle that? My goodness, Gucci flirted back, playing along with the informal and personal vibe of the conversation. In his 2017 visit to the Breakfast Club, Gucci Mane threw a curveball into the mix by hinting that he and Angela Yee weren't just acquaintances through their work, but might have had some private history together. You know, because we, we had already had a history. What? You smash Angela Yee, Gucci? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. Of course not. <laughs> Why you said of course not, bitch? I'm saying, come on, guys. She didn't try it. Okay. She didn't try it. She's on my This bombshell wasn't just a trivial piece of gossip. It fundamentally changed how audiences viewed their previous interactions on air. Before this revelation, most people saw their exchanges as typical media banter. Now, Gucci's statement suggested there might be hidden layers or personal ties that went beyond the microphones and cameras. This allegation not only spiced up their on-screen chemistry, but also introduced an element of personal intrigue into their professional rapport people started to speculate wildly about what their interactions might have looked like off-camera. Was there a flirtation? Did they meet up outside of the studio? Gucci's insinuations opened a Pandora's box of rumors and speculation that drew viewers to reassess every laugh and every seemingly innocuous exchange they had previously witnessed. Following public disagreements, the upcoming revelations will challenge how we see what's real and what's just for show. Questioning the truth behind the cameras. When Gucci directly contradicted Angela Yee's public denials, where she had firmly stated that she had never tried to initiate anything beyond a professional relationship. Um, but I, I mean, fortunately, people that know me in real life really would be like, come on, that's ridiculous. And, mm -hmm. you know, I understand like people don't know me before the Breakfast Club, so they don't understand. I had a show where we talked really crazy all the time. Mm -hmm. And Envy used to be like, I don't know if Angela could come to FM radio because her, you know, the way she talks is so She's crazy. Wild. But mm -hmm. I think that like mature adults know that you can discuss in conversations and that doesn't mean that someone likes you you know mm -hmm. what i mean like me and you could have a conversation like we just were yeah, yeah off right, camera right. where we're talking about sex and things like that and you're not like yeah angela's trying to holler at me that's mm -hmm. not what that means so it cast her in a potentially duplicitous light here was gucci suggesting that angela might be playing a double game keeping a clean professional image for the public while behaving differently in private this clash, black entertainment, television ween, public statements, and private behavior brought a new level of drama to their relationship, making fans question what to believe. Gucci's boldness in bringing this up added layers to what could have been a simple promotional interview. Instead of just discussing music and career, he turned the interview into a discussion forum about personal boundaries, truth, and public persona. The audience was now engaged not just with his music, but with deciphering the real story behind his words. Angela Yee's responses to these claims were dismissive. She suggested that Gucci might be confusing her with someone else, which neither confirmed nor denied anything definitively, but rather added fuel to the fire. That definitely was not me. I don't know who it was, I put my life on that. <laughs> this response was vague enough to keep the speculation alive, making it harder for the audience to pin down the truth of their relationship. This ambiguity served only to deepen the intrigue as it left room for endless interpretation and gossip. The specifics that Gucci brought up, like Angela texting him about his hotel location, suggested a familiarity that went beyond what would be expected of two professionals in a strictly work-related context. These allegations painted a picture of Angela as someone who might not be as straightforward as she appeared. Whether or not these claims were true, they challenged the public's perception of her and introduced a narrative of potential secrecy and hidden motives. Moreover, Gucci's strategy of anchoring his claims to specific instances, like referencing communications after an interview with another media personality, Melissa Ford, gave a semblance of credibility to his story. Gucci added a layer of complexity to the situation by providing details that could be checked or corroborated, inviting the audience to look deeper into the timeline of events he laid out. His comparison of Angela's defensive responses to those of Johnny Cochran was particularly evocative. It dramatized the discourse and framed Angela as someone who was cunningly managing the narrative, perhaps even manipulating facts to suit her defense. 
This portrayal suggested she was not just passively denying the claims, but was actively engaged in a battle of wits and public perception. This public airing of their supposed private matters did more than just entertain. It sparked a broader conversation about the nature of relationships. Black entertainment, television, ween public figures, and how these relationships are presented to the world. It turned casual viewers into detectives, piecing together past interviews and statements to try and uncover the truth. Every smile, every side comment, and every interaction were now scrutinized under this new lens as the public tried to untangle the web of professional and personal dynamics that Gucci and Angela might have woven. The incident wasn't just a fleeting moment in a longer interview. It became a case study in how celebrities manage their private lives once they become public fodder. It raised questions about authenticity, privacy, and the unseen pressures of maintaining a public persona that may not always align with private realities. The discussion around Gucci and Angela's interaction highlighted the complexities of celebrity culture, where personal histories can become public spectacles, and truth can be as elusive as it is enticing. During his 2017 appearance on The Breakfast Club, Gucci Mane dropped a bombshell that shook the foundations of his seemingly professional relationship with Angela Yee. He insinuated they had a past that extended beyond the confines of their work interactions, transforming every previous interview they shared into a subject of scrutiny and gossip. This revelation wasn't just a small comment, it recast their on-air chemistry as something possibly laden with unspoken personal connections. Gucci's claim threw a spotlight on Angela Yee's public persona, suggesting a gap black entertainment television and how she presents herself publicly and her private actions. It forced viewers to question whether their interactions were just friendly banter or if there were deeper, undisclosed connections. Fans and critics began dissecting past footage, searching for any hint of flirtation or personal familiarity, turning what were once considered professional interviews into evidence of a potentially deeper relationship. As this drama unfolded, the consequences were immediate and significant. Gucci alleged that his forthrightness led to him being blacklisted from the breakfast club. Just I hate him, man. That shit ain't no big deal. It's just blown out of proportion. Like, I'm a happily married man. It wasn't even that big of a deal. I didn't even know I was. There was declining the interview until they brought it to my attention. Like, you know you can't go to the breakfast club. And that's why I posted it. Like, mm. is, this, is, the, is this the reason why I can't go to the breakfast club? Because I felt like um, people was having a private conversation about me. They need to be public. Yeah. You know, don't ban me from nobody. What, this is segregation? What y'all gonna tell me what water found to go to? She ain't the program director at the radio station. Can't nobody stop me from going nowhere. A claim that Angela firmly denied. She countered by saying that Gucci was welcome back only if he publicly apologized to her. This standoff didn't just highlight their personal conflict. It also brought to light the power struggles within media interactions, where personal grievances can impact professional opportunities and public images. Gucci's steadfast refusal to apologize and his decision to double down on his claims in a private chat with Charlemagne showed his determination to maintain his narrative. This move ensured the controversy stayed alive, continuously fueling media discussions and public speculation. It became clear that this wasn't going to be a quickly forgotten scandal, but a lingering cloud over both their careers, affecting how audiences perceived both parties. As we uncover more about celebrity lives, new challenges arise when personal matters mix with professional ones making it hard to tell them apart. The big problem with pursuing controversy over content. In today's world, it's almost expected that personal dramas will leak into professional conversations. And this isn't just happening to high-profile figures like Gucci and Angela. A prime example is what happened during 50 Cent's interview with Speedy Mormon. This was supposed to be a chance for 50 Cent to talk about his success as an executive producer. But instead, it turned into an awkward and unwanted dive into his personal conflicts, particularly his beef with French Montana. For sure. Uh, 50, I guess I'll get you out on this. It seems as though it all started with playful banter. It still seems that way to me, but what's up with French? Are you guys cool? Are you not cool? Despite 50 Cent's repeated attempts to steer the discussion back to his career milestones, Mormon wouldn't let up, choosing to pry into past dramas. This highlights a significant issue in how celebrity interviews are conducted. Reporters often prioritize scandalous gossip over discussing professional achievements, seeking to entice viewers with drama rather than substantive conversation. Mormon's fixation on stirring up personal controversies not only threw the interview off track, 
but also clearly annoyed 50 Cent, demonstrating how quickly professional discussions can degenerate into personal squabbles. I don't really have interest in it. Like, there's not much going on. This incident is a clear example of the difficulties celebrities face in trying to control their public image. Interviewers often focus more on generating sensational headlines than on providing a platform for meaningful dialogue about the celebrity's professional work. Similarly, Lil Yachty's uncomfortable interaction with Joe Budden on the show Everyday Struggle further illustrates this trend. Budden's blunt skepticism regarding Yachty's claims of happiness and success wasn't just a simple question. It was almost an attack. Then I would I take don't it care like, about the business part. I problem. care about how Yachty feels. I'm telling you how I feel. I am You're giving happy me every day. Wait, say that. Happy. I am happy every day because life is moving in such a positive way, I can't get slowed down. So maybe he has been media trained. This is a very media trained answer that I'm getting. It's not a media trained right, so answer. Let me answer. respond it's to what you're saying. He seemed to suggest that Yachty's cheerful public demeanor was just a show hinting that there might be hidden troubles beneath his smile. This aggressive questioning forced Yachty into a defensive stance, turning what could have been a straightforward conversation about his music career and lifestyle into a tense and heated debate about whether his public persona was genuine or just a mask. Okay, let me tell you about how humans are. Okay, I'm listening. Feelings are fickle. What that means is they come and they go. Nobody is one thing forever. You cannot tell me, you mm -hmm. would be lying to tell me that as a young man, how old are you? 19. In this industry, in this music industry, in the music business, mm -hmm. you are happy 24 seven. That is a lie. So, that is a that is bullshit so, and I refuse to have somebody tell me bullshit. I wanna have an honest so conversation. So when you come from- Such encounters reveal the adversarial nature of many modern celebrity interviews, where the real intent seems to be provoking controversy rather than exploring the truth or depth of the celebrity's work and life. The focus on extracting contentious remarks rather than celebrating career successes is a disservice not only to the celebrities who are trying to share their stories, but also to the audience seeking to learn about their achievements and challenges. The result is a media landscape where superficial clashes overshadow genuine discussion and where celebrities must navigate a minefield of provocative questions that aim more to unsettle than to inform. Joe Budden really pushed Lil Yachty to the limit in their interview by questioning Yachty's understanding of the music business and his commitment to his music career. I listen to that record and, and don't appreciate a like his talent, or do I judge a like him to have the same bar as a me or him or somebody? I don't do that. That beat came on peekable. It's my first time hearing No, 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 not, not peekable. And as soon as I heard not it, what I say, don't lie to him. No, no, yeah. We don't like what he represents. Truth be told, one of the big things. Whenever Yachty tried to explain how he approached music making, Budden wouldn't really listen. He outright told Yachty that he didn't consider him a true artist and dismissed his music as shallow. By the end of their talk, things got pretty heated, with Yachty getting fed up with Budden's constant critiques and firmly standing by his style of music. Although Yachty tried to keep his cool, he was obviously getting annoyed. Throughout the show, Everyday Struggle, Budden appeared highly skeptical of Yachty's answers suggesting they sounded too rehearsed and lacked authenticity. He suggested that Yachty's consistent positive attitude was more likely the result of good media training. Your response said to me that maybe you were not media trained. Are you media trained? I'm not, it's not that I'm, I'm not media trained, but I learned Do from my mistakes. Do you care? I learned from my mistakes. That was a mistake. That was definitely a mistake. Rather than actual personal feelings. By labeling Yachty's responses as media trained, Budden implied that he didn't really trust Yachty as both an artist and a public figure, hinting that his upbeat answers were more about maintaining a good image than expressing what he truly thought and felt. While Yachty claimed he was always happy, Budden didn't buy it. He challenged the idea that anyone, especially a young rapper deeply involved in the complicated music industry, could be happy all the time. Budden's doubt cast a shadow over Yachty's statements, suggesting it was unrealistic for someone in his position to feel joy continuously. The tension grew as Budden dug deeper, questioning whether Yachty's expressions of happiness were genuine or just a front. This interrogation seemed to imply that if Yachty were a more seasoned or older rapper, the scrutiny might not have been as harsh. Budden seemed to be trying to uncover a lack of realness in Yachty's optimistic outlook on his life and career, signaling his broader dissatisfaction with where hip-hop is heading and the goals its newer artists are setting. 
Yachty's answers to Budden's questions about what he hoped to achieve in hip-hop didn't seem to satisfy Budden, who was probably looking for answers that showed a deeper connection to the music and a serious understanding of the industry. This difference in expectations only intensified Budden's frustration because he seemed to be looking for depth and sincerity, which he felt Yachty was not providing. As the discussion escalated, it became clear that Budden was pushing for Yachty to demonstrate a deeper appreciation for and understanding of the music industry's complexities. The argument brought up a larger issue about what it means to genuinely appreciate and contribute to hip-hop culture, with Budden advocating for a deeper recognition and respect for the industry that seemed absent in Yachty's responses. The confrontation eventually led to questions about whether Yachty was right to walk out of the interview. Some might argue that Budden's probing crossed the line into aggression, making Yachty's decision to leave understandable. Others might see Budden's approach as a necessary challenge to Yachty's views and contributions to the culture. The interview concluded with both parties at odds, leaving viewers to debate the appropriateness of Budden's confrontational tactics and whether Yachty should have stayed to defend his views more robustly. As the dust settled, it was clear that this wasn't just a simple disagreement, but a clash of generations and values within hip-hop. Budin, representing an older, perhaps more traditional view of hip-hop, clashed with Yachty, who embodies the new wave of artists who prioritize different aspects of their careers and lives. This division highlights ongoing debates in the music world about authenticity, the role of artists, and how the industry should evolve. Whether or not one agrees with Budin's methods, the conversation underscored the challenging balance artists must maintain in black entertainment television's personal authenticity and public perception. Do you think rappers are truly misunderstood? Or are these fiery clashes just for show? Could there be deeper issues at play in these interviews? Share your thoughts, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more intriguing insights into the rap world.